Anthony Cox. Uh, like I said, uh, I've been New River Training Center about 10 years. I've been weatherization going on 22 now. So I uh, was a little thinner, had a little more hair, you know, but, uh, you know, I got a passion for this stuff, you know, enjoyed working with the clients and going out and seeing the uh, difference we can make in some of these homes. And, and my experience, you know, started on the crew, you know, wrapping water heaters, insulating attics, and then we got into doing uh, zonal pressures and CAS testing and that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, we'll be using a PowerPoint and some house of pressure here that we developed and uh, to kind of demonstrate some of the things that we're talking about as well. But uh, the last 10 years, I've been pretty much doing, you know, full-time uh, training in the, so. Um, so my name is Phil Hall. Um, I work at, with Anthony at the New River Center for Energy Research and Training, NSERT. Um, moved up there in 2010, uh, been in this industry for about six years now, building science weatherization industry. So um, we're basically just going to go into more, you know, advanced uh, shell diagnostics, you know, uh, touch on a little bit of zonals, but first just kind of look at what the building shell is supposed to look like, you know. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, the thermal and the pressure boundary, uh, they're that line, that, you know, maybe imaginary line at times that separates conditioned air from unconditioned air. It's, a, it's what encloses the living space of our house, okay. Um, and what's really unique about the thermal and pressure boundaries is that they need to be what? Touching. Touching. They need to be in contact with one another, okay. You know, think about it like, uh, I like to describe it as our clothes are our thermal boundary to our skin, okay? If we hold our jacket away from us outside, are we going to be warm? No, we want to tighten it up, right? We pull our jacket in tight, we pull everything against our skin as much as we can. So the insulation, the thermal boundary, needs to be in contact with the pressure boundary. Okay, so is this an aligned thermal and pressure boundary? Okay, I didn't hear you. Is this an aligned thermal and pressure boundary? Okay, thank you. No, it's not, okay? And this is what happens a lot of times when we have new technologies. In this case, this is a floor truss system. This is new construction. It's a little bit different than what you're used to seeing, but this happens even on uh, existing homes. Sometimes the insulation will fall down a little bit or it's installed down at the bottom of the floor joist. It's not touching the floor. It's not touching the pressure boundary. Is it doing it any good? No. no. It's basically like having your jacket sit right here on the table. There's my jacket. I'm standing outside. I'm not going to be warm, right? Okay, so looking at another little diagram of, of thermal and pressure boundary. Are both of them complete? No. no? Why not? We got a hole in the thermal boundary. What's that hole representing? Probably an attic excess, very common. So we could have completely good insulation throughout the entire attic, and we leave the attic access uninsulated. Where's all the heat going to go? Up through that attic access, just like a little chimney, basically. It's the weakest spot in the thermal and pressure boundary. We have a good air barrier, but no insulation. There we go. Here's an example of that. This, this was a little confusing to me because they installed 16-inch bats in 24-inch bays. But they offset them. They offset them. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you get points for that. <laughs> so, basic math, okay? 16 inches is smaller than 24. Doesn't work. Has to go completely side to side all the way end to end, all right? And it, it seems pretty basic for all of us in here because we've, we've seen common mistakes like that, you know. But uh, it's easy to make some, some of these mistakes. Is this a complete thermal and pressure boundary? Yes. Are you sure? <laughs> Look hard. Well, technically. Technically, okay. So yes, no. How many people say yes? How many people say no? How many people say technically? <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> if we look at these two boxes independently, then 
yes, we have a complete pressure boundary, but we don't have insulation here. We have it here. What this signifies a lot of times is something that looks like this. A chase behind a chimney, a plumbing wall or something that somebody has taken and laid a bat over the hole, but there's no barrier at the top. So what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah. What will that uh, insulation look like a lot of times? It's going to be dirty or black. Dirty or sooty looking. Yeah. Right. And, and so basically, it's also kind of a fall hazard. You know, if I'm up there in the attic and I don't take note of maybe that there's potentially a chase somewhere in the attic that I'm looking for, whoop, yeah. it's like a tiger pit. Uh, <laughs> what's another term for that? Those uh, chases, we'll call them bypasses, right? Bypasses. So, it's, you know, it's allowing the air and the heat and the, and the moisture as well to escape from the house, you know, into the attic. And as the air heats up in the house, you know, the warm air is going to want to escape out the top of the building, you know. So uh, even though there's insulation there, it's not a good air barrier. I'm going back one, actually. Okay. So, so yeah, just look, looking at this same chase idea, even if this was completely sealed and these are two separate boxes, what are they connected to? We've just connected the attic to what? Potentially the crawl space or the outside. And what's in the crawl space besides your cat? Unconditioned air, Unconditioned air dirt, moisture. 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 Yeah, the, one of the biggest things that we really worry about in the crawl space. And what's going to happen if that moisture migrates through this chase and ends up up here? It could condense, rain down on top of your ceiling. Hey, I got a roof leak, right? Call the roofer out. He'll sell you a new roof, no problem. But yeah, so you can have problems that start from somewhere else in the house, migrate, and end up, you know, in another part of the house. So we have two different kinds of leakage that we're really kind of looking for when we're looking at the, the building envelope, the thermal and pressure boundary. We have this direct leakage. This is easy, you know, we've got to hold directly to the outside, we can see it. And then we have what we call indirect leakage. Not so easy to find sometimes because the path is different. It's not directly to the outside. It's coming in from somewhere else, migrating through an unconditioned space or an interstitial space. And then this is where we feel the air coming out down here at the outlet. But is that where the air is coming from? If it's maybe connected to an exterior wall, maybe. But if this is an interior wall, it's coming from down the top plate, wire penetration, plumbing penetration, where is it coming from? Through the soffit or, you know, venting? So, how do we find these leaks? We use a blower door. Um, so what does a blower door do? It pulls air out of the house or you pressurize the house. Why? Find leaks. Basically, we're pulling air out of the house and air is coming back in through those leaks, right? That we're looking for. And so then we can walk around with our hands or smoke pencil or thermal camera and we can find those leaks, okay? Blower door also kind of helps us determine how big is the collective leak, right? In some cases it's big enough for a man to crawl through. So um, you talked about that's like approximate leakage area. Yeah. So, you know, you go to Mrs. Jones's house, you say, well, Mrs. Jones, your blower door is 4,000 CFM at 50 pascals. What's that mean to Mrs. Jones? Not a thing, right? But if you could tell Mrs. Jones, if I took all the holes in your house and I put them in one spot, how big the hole would be, you know, that might be useful. So, you know, it's not a perfect way, but a, a, what they call an approximate leakage area. You could take your blower door, divide it by 10, or knock off the last digit. That's a good visual for the homeowner, too, because she may not be able to visualize 500 square inches. It's a, it's a really big number still, but you can divide it by 144, which is... 12 by 12, the amount of square inches in one foot, and then basically say, hey, you know, see this sheet of paper? We've got maybe three or four of these is what we're looking for. Or, hey, uh, your entire house is wide open. You got a front door open in yeah, your house somewhere. It's about the size of a window or door. <laughs> about the size of a window or door. And that's open how long? Year round. Oh, year right. round. Yeah. Yep. So, so then we use these other things <clears throat> that we'll talk about to help find where are the holes? Because it's not all in one hole, so we have to find holes. Exactly. So, is it easy to see the holes in this picture? You see the holes? No. Why not? 
Too much junk there. Huh? Too much junk? Yeah, a lot of junk in this picture. Insulation, dead raccoons, you know, boards, boxes of Christmas decorations, you know, whatever. It's in the way. So it can be really difficult to say, okay, we're going to find the leaks in, in this situation unless we're going to take everything out, which can be costly and time consuming as well. So, all right, let's stop there. For more information about the New River Center for Energy Research and Training, please visit us at nrcert.org. Or you can call the NRCERT office at 540-260-9081. The New River Center for Energy Research and Training, conserving energy today for a greener tomorrow.